Coming up, two courtrooms, one defendant. Donald Trump, the focus of two major legal showdowns today. The question before the Supreme Court, should Trump and all other presidents be totally immune from prosecution? The justices seem dubious, but intensely divided. We'll break it down with our reporter who is inside. 200 miles away in Manhattan, the hush money trial is picking up steam. The former publisher of the National Enquirer back on the stand today facing a grilling from the defense. Trump on trial starts right now. Good evening, and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Chris Wynn in Washington. After a now customary Wednesday recess, Donald Trump's criminal trial resumed today in New York. Back on the stand for a third straight day, David Pecker. The former publisher of the National Enquirer offered up five hours of testimony. For most of the day, Pecker answered questions from the prosecution about how he used the tabloid to help Donald Trump's 2016 presidential election bid. Then in the afternoon, Trump's lawyers got their first crack. And when it was over, the former president stepped up to the mics outside the courtroom. This is a trial that should have never happened. This is a case that should have never been filed. And it was really an incredible, an incredible uh, day. Open your eyes. And we can't let this continue to happen to our country. Happening alongside the testimony today in New York, the long-awaited Supreme Court hearing into Trump's plea for absolute presidential immunity. This stems from the federal January 6th case. Trump's attorneys argued that many of Trump's actions aimed at overturning the 2020 presidential election results were done in his official capacity as president. As such, he claims Trump is protected from prosecution. The government's attorney argued that's not a right granted by the Constitution. No word yet on when the court will issue a decision. We start tonight with our correspondents who were both in places where the action happened. National political correspondent Alex Miller is in Manhattan. And congressional correspondent Stephanie Liebergen is in Washington tonight. But Alex, let's start with you. Uh, what more can you tell us about what happened inside the courtroom in New York? Well, the bulk of the day was spent on talking about Karen McDougal, the Playboy model who the former president, then candidate Trump, paid off allegedly ahead of the 2016 election. David Pecker on the stand today explaining how it all went down. He said that it was Michael Cohen who is the one who pushed him to make that deal with Karen McDougal. There was a discussion that went back and forth about who was going to end up paying for this in the end. Remember, $150,000 according to Michael Cohen he told David Pecker that the boss would take care of it and that happened multiple times throughout the morning. He used the term the boss when prosecutors asked to clarify who that was. Uh, David Pecker said it was Donald Trump. But because Trump took so long, according to David Pecker, to reimburse him for those payments to Karen McDougal, it made Pecker decide not to pick up the Stormy Daniels tab. And so Trump had to go elsewhere and figure out a different way to handle that situation. But this isn't the first time that David David Pecker has engaged in the catch and kill scheme, so to say, even though he said he didn't know that term until this uh, investigation first began. He did say that he engaged in checkbook journalism, meaning that he paid for stories whether or not he was going to use them, he used them for different purposes. But he did business with Donald Trump for decades. They had a relationship both inside and outside of AMI, the uh, publishing company that David Pecker headed up. They worked on a magazine together, and he said that he tried to push away stories that were bad for the former president and publish stories that made him look good. But he also bought other stories, including for Arnold Schwarzenegger when he decided to run for president. Nearly a million dollars he spent on behalf of Arnold Schwarzenegger. A comparison but that the uh, defense team decided to draw between the two was that Arnold Schwarzenegger never had to pay him back, even though that was clearly a stipulation when it came to Donald Trump. Now, he also bought stories he told the jury uh, to try to leverage things that he wanted, including an interview for his men's fitness magazine with Tiger Woods. He bought photos and a story from a source that wasn't Tiger Woods in order to pressure him to do so. So he said this wasn't the first time they had had a relationship, uh, but he did get a reward in a, tr in a dinner to the White House with friends uh, to thank him for the work that he did with Karen McDougal. 
And Alex, uh, you know, Judge Mershon released an update on the gag order against the former president, something that we've been closely watching. Uh, tell us what happened with that. Well, he has not made a decision on any of the gag order allegations that we have seen so far, but the prosecution says they have four more instances that they are filing a complaint about. If you're keeping track, that's 15 in less than two weeks that they say the judge needs to deal with. The four that they put forward today, two of them have to do with Michael Cohen. One of them has to do with comments that Trump made just outside of the courtroom where he said the jury was 95 percent Democrat, and one from this morning when he made a campaign stop before court where he he said David Pecker was a nice guy. So uh, there's going to be a hearing on the, on those allegations next Wednesday at 2.15 p.m. And as far as the other gag order allegations that we've seen come from the prosecution, the decision from the judge on those could come at any point. National political correspondent Alex Miller live in New York. Alex, thank you. Let's turn now to our congressional correspondent, Stephanie Liebergen in Washington, with more on today's immunity hearing at the Supreme Court. Uh, Steph, uh, roughly three hours of oral arguments. Uh, what were the biggest takeaways? One of the big things that the justices talked about over and over again during the arguments today was the issue of an official act, uh, official presidential act versus a personal or private act. There was some agreement that official presidential acts might be due some type of criminal immunity, but there were some questions about what's the motivation behind those official acts. One justice noting that almost anything a first term president does could be construed as a personal or private motivation aimed at getting reelected. But that question, official act, personal private act went hand in hand with the concept of absolute criminal immunity that Trump's defense team was really pushing for. And that got the justices into a lot of hypothetical presidential situations. Could a president sell nuclear secrets? Could a president take bribes in exchange for a political appointment? And the justices charged John Sauer, Trump's defense attorney, speaking for him in court today with some of those hypotheticals and said, if this is an official act, does he think it should be immune? Take a listen. He was the president. He um, uh, is the commander in chief. Um, he talks to his generals all the time and he told the generals, I don't feel like leaving office. I want to stage a coup. Is, is, is that immune? If, if it's an official act, there needs to be impeachment and conviction beforehand because the framers viewed the that, that kind of if very it's an official risk. act, is it an official act? If it's an official act, it's impeachment. Is it an official act? On, on the way you described that hypothetical, it could well be. Trump and his defense team have argued repeatedly that they think there will be a chilling effect on the presidency if the concept of absolute criminal immunity is not upheld by the Supreme Court. But the justices almost seemed more concerned about the opposite situation, about a president being unbound by the law and being unbound by any sort of morality or limitation on what is and isn't legal or illegal, not having to face any type of criminal prosecution for decisions made as president. The justices were worried about that potential outcome and what that might do to the Oval Office, but all of them very aware of the fact that the decision they make in this case will definitely impact the president, the power of the presidency going forward, Chris. Yeah, and to your point, uh, you know, now the clock starts ticking. Uh, any indication, any clues as to when we might get a decision from the court? That's the magic question we all wish we had the answer to, but in typical Supreme Court fashion, the court does not announce any um, information about the upcoming opinions before they're released. So we'll get lots of opinion days between now and the end of the term in uh, late June, maybe in early July if things go a little late. The opinion could come down really any time in the next two months, but I would expect probably not in the next few weeks. I would expect the justices need to take some time to consider the arguments they heard, discuss amongst each other, vote, write their opinions and their dissents. So probably a few weeks out, but really the Supreme Court could decision can come down any time between now and the end of June. No. Re appreciate the analysis. Congressional correspondent Stephanie Liebergen. Steph, thank you. We'll see you soon. As you just heard, there's more than just the hush money trial to talk about today. The Supreme Court heard Donald Trump's plea for absolute immunity. We'll dive into the arguments and how a decision, even if it goes against Trump, could still work to his advantage. More on that when we return. Presidential immunity, very powerful. Presidential immunity is imperative, or you practically won't have a country anymore. 
Donald Trump thinks presidents need sweeping protection from prosecution, but never in our country's history has the idea of absolute presidential immunity been put to the test until today. One of Trump's attorneys argued before the Supreme Court that efforts by Trump to overturn the 2020 election results were official acts and as such shielded from prosecution. We're joined now by Robert Tsai, a law professor at Boston University and the author of Demand the Impossible, One Lawyer's Pursuit of Equal Justice for All. Uh, Robert, before we have you comment, we want to play one of the exchanges that really encapsulated the argument over presidential immunity. Take a listen. If the president decides that his rival is a corrupt person and he orders the military or orders someone to assassinate him, is that within his official acts that for which he can get immunity? It would depend on the hypothetical that we can see that could well be an official act. It could, and why? Just one of several hypotheticals the justices threw out today to Trump attorney John Sauer. Uh, Robert, do you believe he made a convincing argument that presidents, uh, that presidents uh, should have sweeping protections from prosecution? Chris, it's great to be with you. Um, I think he did not uh, convince uh, enough of the justices uh, of his uh, primary argument, which is that a president should enjoy this sort of absolute immunity uh, that uh, former President Trump is asking for. Um, this case does look like it's it's setting up to be one where the justices are interested in using it as a vehicle for some fairly broad constitutional policy making. Uh, many of them um, were former uh, executive branch lawyers and former executive branch lawyers who become justices uh, are inclined to protect uh, the presidency. Uh, so I do think that you're gonna see uh, a somewhat broader opinion than, than many people uh, perhaps uh, were hoping to see. Uh, but I don't think you're gonna, they're gonna go quite as broad as uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Trump is uh, asking for. I think Justice Sotomayor in the clip you just showed uh, highlighted uh, just how dangerous it would be uh, uh, if a, a president got that kind of immunity. And I know you heard this earlier, uh, Trump's attorney tried to make the distinction today between acts Trump made in his official capacity as president and others done privately. Can you expand on that some more for us? Absolutely, that, that is a distinction that comes out of some earlier case law uh, going back to uh, former President Nixon. Uh, and I, I, I expect that the justices will uh, continue to hew to that line. Now, a number of the um, justices who've grown up uh, in the Reagan years and the, in the uh, uh, Bush uh, presidencies, I think would prefer that much more is covered uh, by the notion of a president's uh, official actions. Um, so that's kind of where the rubber is going to meet the road is is how how much they're going to uh, define that notion out. Um, but I don't expect them to uh, obliterate that distinction. Um, and that will help those cases where uh, it seems pretty clear that you've got uh, allegations that happened before uh, Trump became president, uh, uh, such as the uh, alleged hush, hush money um, uh, case. Um, but uh, for, for this one, uh, I think we're going to have a little bit of a tricky scenario uh, with the justices trying to figure out how much of uh, President Trump's actions in trying to stay uh, in office could be described as official behavior and how much really is beyond the scope of his official duties. And how about the government's attorney? He, he essentially argued that the Constitution doesn't give presidents a get out of jail free card. Uh, and in fact, he made the case that the founders didn't want another king. Uh, how persuasive was he? I think in general, uh, pretty persuasive. He, he had a little bit of an uh, uphill battle trying to uh, defend the, the, the lower court, the D.C. Circuit's decision, which was pretty... Um, dismissive of, of Mr. Trump's um, uh, immunity uh, decision. And, uh, you know, even Chief Justice Roberts seemed um, uh, to dislike, uh, you know, the opinion below as not being protective enough of presidents, P putting aside what uh, Mr. Trump is alleged to have done here. Uh, a lot of the justices didn't really want to get in the facts of this particular case. So uh, wherever they draw the line, uh, I will be surprised if they protect all of uh, his actions. Uh, but um, they, they clearly want to think about uh, future presidents. Uh, and uh, several of the justices mentioned that they're, they're really worried about um, uh, 
uh, prosecutors, uh, independent counsels, uh, chasing presidents after they're out of office uh, for rather small things. Um, a lot of the hypotheticals involve these kinds of uh, scenarios. Uh, so uh, I think they're very much setting up to try to uh, be a little bit more protective uh, of a president, but uh, not as far as uh, his own lawyers uh, uh, asking for. Robert Tsai, law professor at Boston University. Robert, thanks so much for the insight and conversation. All right, Trump on trial returns after this quick commercial break. Keep it here. You're watching Scripps News. Today was uh, breathtaking in this room. You saw what went on. It was breathtaking and uh, amazing testimony. Donald Trump left the courtroom today seemingly pleased about his day in court. His defense team opened its cross-examination of one-time National Enquirer executive David Pecker. But before that, the prosecution got him to talk more about catch and kill, his effort to buy and bury stories that might have hurt Trump's 2020 re-election bid. Nima Romani is a former federal prosecutor and the president of West Coast Trial Lawyers. He joins us now. Uh, Nima, great to see you on the program. Uh, what stood out to you most from today's hearing? Well, today's hearing in the New York Hush Money case, of course, was David Pecker's cross-examination. But obviously, I think all eyes were on the U.S. Supreme Court and the oral arguments. And it was clear there, I think the justices were going to reject Trump's absolute immunity argument. It was overreaching on the part of his lawyers, frankly. And I think they lost credibility, just like they lost credibility in the trial court when they argued just two days ago that Trump didn't violate the gag order. So I think it's clear that the justices are going to send the case back down to the lower courts to determine whether Trump's conduct related to the Capitol riots and the events leading up to January 6th and the fake elector scheme were they official acts which would be immune or personal ones which would be not and going back to New York during cross-examination the defense team brought up the fact that Michael Cohen wasn't working as part of the Trump campaign a Trump defense attorney Emil Bove asked David Pecker quote uh, Cohen was always clear with you that he was not working with the campaign and David Pecker responded yes so Nima that's central to the defense's case isn't it that Cohen was working on his own well it's central for two reasons one it distances Trump from the conspiracy itself he's arguing of course he had nothing to do with any of this and this was Cohen and to the extent that they're false business records that was something that his accountant did and that it was booked as a legal expense and of course, it's important that Cohen wasn't related to the campaign because we know that under New York law, false business records, they're only a misdemeanor unless they can be proven to be in furtherance of or to cover up another crime. And the state is arguing that this was an unlawful campaign finance violation or an attempt to mislead the voters during the 2016 election. So if Cohen had nothing to do with the campaign, then maybe even if the prosecution is successful, these are just misdemeanors, which would be a slap on the wrist. Let's talk about the gag order. Uh, Judge Mershon gave us an update today uh, saying he plans to consider four new alleged violations uh, brought to his attention by the prosecution. Uh, what more can you share about that? Chris, I'm smiling because Trump has seemingly violated the gag order at every possible turn. And whether it's four or 40, the question is, really, isn't really did Trump violate the order, but what is Judge Juan Marchand actually going to do about it? Is he going to actually put some teeth into that order? Or are we going to talk about nominal fines like Judge Engeron, the judge in the New York civil fraud case, he fined Trump five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. Well, that's not going to change Donald Trump's behavior. That's walking around money for him. So is there going to be a more serious sanctions or are we talking about these fines that really won't amount to much in this case? Well, yeah, let's expand on that a little more. You know, what other options can the judge take at this point? Well, the most extreme option would be holding Donald Trump in criminal contempt and jailing him. Now, I think that's very unlikely. I don't think anyone has the stomach to really take the unprecedented step of jailing a former president. There would be political unrest, maybe even civil riots. Now, short of that, what can the judge do? Maybe give uh, adverse jury instructions or do other things related to the case itself that make it more difficult for Trump to win and just instruct the jurors that Trump is in violation of a court order. That type of adverse instruction would be damaging to the defense. 
Yeah, the uh, $1,000 fine per violation probably isn't going to uh, <laughs> too much, right? Um, <laughs> hey, before you go, uh, what should we be looking out for when court uh, tomorrow uh, resumes? The cross-examination of the witnesses is, is going to be key. And obviously, we know we're not there yet, but Michael Cohen is a key witness for the state. But obviously, he's a convicted felon and an admitted liar. Stormy Daniels, of course, uh, has previously denied having the affair. So, you know, David Pecker is the state's first witness. And personally, you're talking about someone who's an alleged co-conspirator, at least according to the prosecution's opening statement, and testifying under a grant of immunity. So I expect the cross-examination to continue to be more aggressive and for the defense to argue that this is someone who's lying to save himself or to sell more magazines. All right, Nima Romani, former federal prosecutor. Uh, Nima, thank you for your time tonight. We do appreciate it. All right, that'll do it for us tonight. Thanks so much for watching Trump on Trial. I'm Chris Wynn.